Folks at home, welcome back to the Crimson Oak Pond, and if you're new to this series, we built this five acre pond over the past year, and it took us several months to get all of the dirt excavated, and we had to bring in several truckloads of clay, and we also built an island, a dock, and got all the structure in place, and then it took a couple of months to get it full of water. After that, we stocked it with a bunch of bait fish, including bluegills and threadfin shad, and not long after that, we stocked it with these little two inch aggressive bass. And we're going to be giving you an update on them here in just a minute and showing you how big they've gotten. But today's an exciting day because we're going to begin the tagging process with all of our bass. And the idea for tagging all of our bass started when several of you suggested that we tag our pets that are living in our backyard pond before we put them into the five acre pond so we could track them in the future and know if we caught them again. But then we had the idea to tag the first 100 bass we catch in the five acre pond and create a contest with them that you all will be involved in. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a moment. But first, let's talk about the tagging process because there are a few different ways you can do it. The simplest way of tagging any fish is what I call a dart tag. And those are the yellow tags that you see in this image. And this is probably your most common way of tagging fish because it's easy and simple. And each time you catch the fish, you just read off the tag information and compare it to when that fish was previously caught. But the tagging system that we're going to be using is a little more advanced and is called a PIT tagging system. And PIT just stands for Passive Integrated Transponders, and they're just tiny microchips that are activated when it gets near an antenna. So I'll show you a little more detail on that. This is basically what you call a PIT scanner right here, just a battery backpack. These are what you load the PIT tags into. It's a 10 cartridge holder. Got a Bluetooth device to hook it up to a computer, and then... Here we have the pit tag injector and these things to kind of give you a frame of reference. They're about the size of a thumbnail. So inside of that is a little RFID tag. And one of the reasons I chose to use these RFID pit tags is because there's not a battery inside of any of these tags. So that means each tag will last the entire lifetime of the fish. So now let's show you how this is gonna work. We got our scanner here. That's what it looks like on the back side. And this tag is gonna be inside the belly of a fish. Well, let's go ahead and scan it. And as you can see there, it's got a unique 12 digit number that's gonna pop up. Let's go ahead and load one of the cartridges up and we'll show you how the injector works. All right, we got some pit tags inside of here. We're just gonna load that right into the top of it. Slide that tip end in and then there you go. So it's pretty simple setup. That little rod pushes the pit tag into the fish. And because we're using the pit tags, that allows me to use some more advanced ways of collecting the data from the fish. So not only will these tags work with the RFID scanner, but they also make these antennas that you can customize and put beneath the surface of the water or anywhere around the pond. And biologists have used these methods for years in streams to track trout and to collect data for travel patterns for fish throughout rivers and streams across the world. But my idea is to put several of these antennas throughout the pond. So we may start off putting one around the dock and one around the tunnels we've added to the pond. So each time a fish swims through the tunnel, It'll get scanned and we'll have that data. But my overall goal is to create a topo map of the pond similar to this with different antennas placed around the pond. So each time a fish enters that area, it'll populate a red dot and that'll be just about as close as you can get to real time data on where the fish are hanging out in the pond. So now that we know how the tagging system works, the only thing left to do is go catch some fish. So I'm gonna be using the bait tank to hold the fish temporarily and initially I was going to add some anesthetic, which will help calm the bass down during the tagging process. But we had our first freeze last night, and a lot of times when the water temps drop that much, the bass get lethargic. And if you can catch them, they're usually pretty laid back and not flopping around very much. So we're going to try the first one without any anesthetics. All right, about to get started. I'm going to use a drop shot rig. That seems to have worked in the past. Just got a little small swim bait on it. There's one. Got him. Good one. Yes, sir. Nice one. Another one with green mark on his lip, but man, they're growing quick. Nice thick belly on him. Perfect. Go ahead and put him here in the holding tank. All right, we got the alcohol here on the left. 
We're gonna sterilize the needle. Then I've got some pond water right here. Gonna rinse that alcohol off. Should be good to go. Time to tag the first pass. He is right at 11 and a quarter inches. So the tagging process is supposed to be pretty painless for the bass if you do it up near their dorsal fins. And we're going to start out by removing some of the scales. And the scales on a bass are like fingernails for us. They grow right back. And I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit worried about doing this. But it seems to be a quick and simple process. And the bass didn't seem to be bothered at all. Tag went in. Nice and easy. And there we go. Did not even flop around. That went pretty smooth, about as smooth as I could have hoped it to go, so. And he's off, perfect. All right, let's go do some more. So we've been doing a lot of cooking out here at the farm and since it is Thanksgiving week, I decided to show you Liz's secret family turkey recipe. And I'm not talking about your traditional turkey or even deep fried turkey. Today we're gonna be doing fried turkey strips. And today's cooking segment is going to be sponsored by Kamikoto Knives. And if you're not familiar with them, these knives are made using high quality Japanese steel. And each knife goes through a 19 step process that takes several years to complete. And you know me, being an outdoorsman, one of the most important factors in a knife is how sharp it is. And I can honestly say that these are some of the sharpest knives I've ever owned. All right, Liz, go ahead and tell them about the secret family recipe. <laughs> okay, so we like to use the butterball turkey breast instead of a full turkey. We put it in the pot with celery, onions, and a bell pepper with salt and pepper and cook it for about 30 minutes. So once you get all your vegetables chopped up, you boil them with the turkey for 30 minutes. And this not only adds flavor to the turkey, it makes it easier for the turkey to peel. And so once you take it out, you wanna peel small turkey strips off of it and you wanna go along with the grain. And the next step is to soak them in buttermilk. And for the batter, we like to use Tony's and flour. And once you get that grease up to above 350, you wanna fry them until they're golden brown. And while we're waiting on them to finish up, you know you have to have that secret sauce. It's pretty simple. We're just adding Creole mustard, jalapenos, and mayo. Mix it together in a mason jar, and it goes perfect with these fried turkey strips. Take them out of the grease once they're golden brown. And trust me, folks, if you ever do your turkey like this for Thanksgiving, you'll never do it any other way. And this Kamikoto knife set has been perfect for recipes like this. It has the 7-inch vegetable knife, the 8.5-inch slicing knife, and last but not least, the 5-inch utility knife. And these knives are used by Michelin star chefs all over the world. And one of the things I really liked about this is it comes in an ash wood box, which makes it perfect for a gift. So if you're looking for a new knife set, it's perfect timing because they are having a Black Friday sale this week. And then on top of that, you can also get an additional $50 off by clicking on the link in the description below. And all this turkey's got me excited. Happy Thanksgiving, folks. Biting pretty good, right there around the oak throne. Another one about the same size. They've all got the green spot on their head. <laughs> These are just gonna be some green bass. All right, fish number two is 638. Perfect. Love seeing those little bellies on them. Head on out there and get you some more to eat. Another nice one. Alright, fish number three is ten and a half. Fish number three is ninety-nine seventy-five. So we've tagged three bass today and we're gonna stop there just to make sure all of these survive and don't have any issues. But we're gonna be tagging several more in each of our upcoming videos. And let's explain the contest real quick. So we're gonna tag the first 100 bass we catch in the pond and I'm letting you all name them. And if I select your name, your YouTube channel gets added to this list and then you can see the pit tag will be right here beside it. And each time we catch them, we're gonna track their length, weight, and girth. 
but I didn't want to overwhelm the bass today and keep them out of the water too long. So we're only going to weigh the bass the second time we catch them. But we're still taking fish name suggestions. And so if you see an empty letter on this spreadsheet, leave a comment down below with a fish name. And the reason you want to get on the list is because we got some cool prizes and giveaways. So let's take a look at some of those challenges. So the first categories are tracking the fastest growing bass in the pond. So the first winners are going to be the fish that reach the one, two, three, and four pound marks. And whoever's bass reaches five pounds first will actually get a trip to come out here and catch some themselves. And as this contest goes along, we're going to keep adding different categories as a way of showing our thanks to all of you that have followed the entire Pond Build series. And we also just added one new category of the first bluegill to reach a pound. And so I'm going to tag five bluegills and their names are going to start with A, B, M, S, and T. So all you have to do to enter the contest is leave a fish name down in the comments below. And now it's time to introduce you to the newest members of the Bama Bass family, our baby mallard ducks. These cute little guys are about two days old <laughs> and have been extremely fun to watch. But our goal for them is to become the first occupants of the Duckingham Palace. That's the advanced duck house that you've seen us build in the past couple of videos. But there's one small problem. When ducks are first born, they don't have oil on their feathers, so you can't submerge them in water right away. And since we also just had a cold front come through with sub-freezing temperatures, we're going to keep them in this enclosure. We've also got a heater attached to it so they can get up under there and stay warm. But I was talking to a biologist about how to successfully keep ducks at your pond. And he said the best way to do it is when you get some baby ducks, you start them out inside of a pen that is halfway on the land and halfway in the water. And you'll keep them in there for the first few weeks until they develop their feathers. But at the same time, you're feeding them every day, so it's essentially becoming their home. And then once they're able to fly, you basically remove the pen, and it's up to them whether they want to fly away or hang out at the pond. But hopefully, with all the amenities of the Duckingham Palace, they'll decide to stay around, or at least come back and visit us every once in a while. But I tell you, there is going to be one person upset if they don't come back, and that's Sarah. Because she's basically been their mom the past couple of days, playing with them, keeping them warm, and we had to teach them how to drink water and eat their food. And that only took about a day. Now they're all eating that high-protein diet and will be growing up quick. You can see we got them hanging out here in the man cave, and Milo ain't quite sure what to think about them. All right, now it's time to take a look at some of the bluegill feeder cams and watch these aggressive guys eat. So I am a little bit surprised because now that we've gotten those colder temperatures, I thought we'd see less and less action from the bluegills. But so far, they're still up eating every day. And typically in the winter time, since I'm not fertilizing the pond water, everything clears up. So one of my goals over the next few weeks is to get some good underwater cameras to not only see the underwater shots of the bluegill action, but also to go around to all of these different brush piles, tunnels, and structure in the pond and see what type of fish are hanging out at each spot. It'll also help me get an idea on how much bait we have left in the pond and let me know if we need to add some more here soon. Now it's time to feed our little pond mascot, Tiger. So on this particular night, we were having a lunar eclipse called the Blood Moon, so you know I had to go out and try to capture it. But one thing I want to mention to you fishermen, if you ever get the opportunity to fish during a lunar eclipse, I would highly recommend it because this is by far the most activity we've had at night out here with the bass. As I was setting up these night lapse cameras, you could hear explosions across the pond, and it absolutely triggered a feeding frenzy with all the fish. So I started out with multiple different camera angles because I knew that the lunar eclipse wouldn't happen until closer to daylight in our region. 
And you can see this is the first pass as the moon's coming up through about midnight. And this is when we swap over to the other angle after midnight. In hindsight, I wish I could have angled the camera a little bit more because as you can see the moon going down and the lunar eclipse starting, the moon is just barely going to go out of sight before we get to see that blood moon. Oh well, better luck next time. And it's safe to say that the full moon has increased the deer activity. Everybody's out and about feeding around the pond, but I want you to pay close attention on the left side of the screen to those eyes that you see out in the pond. That's a new duck that just showed up this past week, and he may become the star of the show. I literally cannot stop watching him because every day, crazy things happen around him. And some of this stuff you're not going to believe. I could do a full video of just this little guy. But I'm going to give you a sneak peek at some of the footage you're going to be seeing with him next week. As most of you know, the owls have been around since the beginning of the pond build. And so when a new bird showed up, it was going to be turf wars. But this new duck says, I'm here to stay, and I'm not scared of you at all. Can't wait to show you guys. I've got some pretty wild footage that you're going to be seeing next week. Now we're going to take a quick trip down to the creek and check on the crawfish traps. We also got a little bit of rain over the past couple of weeks, so the creeks are moving pretty good. And check that out, it even washed my trap up onto the land. Oh yeah, even though it got washed up onto the bank, it still caught some before the storm. All right, we're gonna see if the bass wanna eat some of these later in the video. All right, now it's time to feed the most aggressive bass on the planet, Mr. Moby. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button to follow along with this pond series and all of the entertaining wildlife we have out here at the Crimson Oak Pond. But I hope you all enjoyed this video, and we will see you all next time.